Hello, I'm Anthony. Welcome back to the Korg WaveStation tutorial. Today, we're going to take a look at a couple of subjects. We're going to have a look at vector synthesis, which is clearly a very important component of the synthesizer. A large part of the user interface is dedicated to it. And also, we're going to have a look at the routing options. That, in turn, is going to involve us having a look at the effects engine. Hope you're enjoying this series so far. Check out the Patreon and channel member links below if you'd like to help support my channel so that I can carry on making videos like this. Okay, so today I've dialed up my simple template sound, which is a single oscillator um, with an organ sound. As simple as you like. At the moment, that sound is mono. There's nothing complicated going on at all. That's a single oscillator routing to both outputs. And in fact, in this context, vector synthesis is pretty much pointless because vector synthesis is all about mixing together multiple different sounds. Lots of times during this video series, we've talked about four different oscillators in banks A to D. This is really the central concept of vector synthesis and why we have the letters around the outside. Let's introduce a second oscillator so we can start talking about it more meaningfully. I'm going to turn the structure into a two oscillator mode. Now I have a choir in output C. The reason why A and C are paired together and B and D are paired together is because they're on opposite sides of each axis of the vector control. So now if I press a key down on the keyboard, we get a mix of choir and organ together because the vector joystick is in the center position. If I move this joystick over to the left hand side, we're just gonna hear organ. And on the right hand side, we're gonna hear choir. To get the full use out of vector synthesis, of course, we need to switch to four oscillator mode. So let's do that. Now that we've got four different sounds, everything's gonna get a little bit louder. So I'll just turn them all down a little bit. And by default on this particular performance, you can see that oscillators B and D have the same sound. So let's throw something a little bit different into oscillator D, flute will do. So now organ on the A, there's the EP on B, choir sounding much better in octave lower and flute on D. The user interface is vector joystick operates on all parts simultaneously. Now this performance only has a single part at the moment, but if we loaded up eight different parts, obviously you've only got one joystick on the synthesizer. Pretty much stands to um, reason that whatever oscillators you have assigned to A, B, C, and D, they're all gonna get mixed according to the position of this joystick. So just bear in mind that you are gonna be operating on all parts simultaneously. So far so good but at the moment it's a static control. I would need my hand on the joystick, on the physical instrument if I wanted to control this thing, but we can automate the vector position. Now there are a couple of ways that you can do it. If you have a look in the settings menu, you'll see a couple of um, continuous controller options uh, that can be assigned to CC16 and 17. That's all very well and good, but the Korg Wave Station is also automation enabled. What this means is, what I find the easiest way to control a joystick from is from within Cubase itself, actually from within the DAW. If I engage right automation and just begin, I've got a simple single note part here. If I get that part playing and then move the joystick. That automation has been written into the part and now if I turn right automation mode off, this read automation is gonna get read back and will represent in the user interface. So now if I was writing music in Cubase, more often than not, I'll actually get my pencil tool out on the automation lanes and write it in here manually. But if you wanna interact with the joystick from your keyboard, you'll use those continuous controller data values but this isn't particularly a study in automation, so I don't really want to concentrate on that too much more. I'm going to disable the read options and delete these tracks so that I can maintain manual control from within the interface. So in addition to being able to pick up this shiny little joystick control and move it with my mouse, I can also record what, what is effectively automation into the patch itself. This top right-hand section of the patch is all about programming vector synthesis control. So let's have a look at how we can program vector dynamics into the sound itself. We have a five point ve vector matrix. And if you click on each one of these points, can you see that that little square just turned blue? 
Now at the moment, when I'm clicking on each of these points, it looks like nothing's happening, but these are actually different nodes. To make it really obvious what's going on here, we're gonna start off at point zero, which is the, the moment when you hit the key, you start off at point zero. I'm gonna pick up this little blue square and drag it all the way to the left. And can you see these numbers in the matrix changing? Unfortunately, you can't edit these numbers in the matrix manually. The A, B, C, D numbers are all read only. You have to inter interact with the user interface for these little uh, blue squares. So we'll make the start of the journey sound pure organ. Then we're gonna to move to point number one. And now you can see we have a different colored square. This is the second point conveniently called point number one. I'm gonna drag that up to B, which is gonna be the soft EP. The next stage in the journey is gonna be all the way over on C and drag down to D. The fifth point is kind of pointless because it's a release point. I'm gonna draw it in anyway, just for completeness. I'm gonna set loop to off so that we don't have to worry about it. These times numbers represent how long it takes to get from one point to the next. And because point zero is always the start of the journey, there is no time for that. Just for now, I'll leave these numbers as is and we'll hear what we've got. Organ, EP, choir, flute. So we've transitioned to each of those sounds according to this vector plan. We've settled out on the flute. Point number three is actually your sustain point. So by default, this is as far as the journey is going to go. This final point, which brings us back to our origin, is actually your release cycle. So you're only gonna hear this final stage if you actually have an extended release cycle, which we don't on this particular sound. I'm gonna increase the time of point number one a little bit to make it a bit more even. And now I'm gonna introduce looping. Let's have a look at our looping options. So you can see there are no 0.4 nodes here. Once again, that's the release cycle. So you can't loop around your release cycle. Do we want to go forward only or do we want to go forwards and backwards? Let's go forwards and backwards between points one and three. So what's going to happen now is that we're going to bounce between the soft EP to the quiet to the flute and back between those three nodes. So after we've heard the organ at the beginning of the note, we're never going to hear it again. And you can hear effectively that choir kind of tremoloing because it's never really fully out of the mix. Sure enough, when you get to points D and B, it's at its quietest, but then you immediately start traveling back towards the choir. So you're kind of hearing it all the time. Now, each part in your performance, which is effectively the same as saying each patch in your performance, has its own vector matrix. So even though the primary joystick the kind of the keyboard centric joystick operates over all of your different parts. Every patch has its own vector matrix. So if we introduce a second sound into this performance, I'll just load up any old patch. It doesn't particularly matter which one. Now you can see we have a completely different matrix back up to our original one. And there's the one we, we just programmed in. This allows you to specify very complex mixing relationships between all of the different parts of your performance. So the thing is constantly evolving. And it's one of the reasons why the WaveStation performances sound so rich, because they very often use multiple different patches with different vector matrices. Let's have a quick look at another couple of preset options to drive the point home. I'm gonna load RAM1 slot five soft waves. So let's have a look what the vector matrix is doing in this case. So we start off at point zero, which is in the center of the graph. And then we're gonna to go to the right, all the way over to the left-hand node, back to the middle again. And our loop is naught to three. So that is gonna happen repeatedly. In other words, we're gonna very slightly, gonna to gently toggle between the A and C sounds. This time I'm gonna load a sound from ROM4, Ancient Light. Again, a single part. This time we've got four oscillators and here's our vector matrix. Now three of these different oscillators are wave sequences. 
but we're also traveling before those between those four different sounds via the vector matrix and we're in backwards and forwards looping mode. If you want to really kind of home in on each one of those sounds and hear what it's contributing to the effect, don't forget you can always override the vector matrix behavior manually with your vector control. So there's your A sound. Unknown is quite kind of a mysterious sort of sound effect laden thing. There's B. There's your hell bell. And the synth pad is your tremolo effect. Put the vector control back in the center. That's gonna allow the matrix to do its full thing. So you basically got kind of a combined modulation system here. The vector joystick is effectively modulating this vector matrix itself. So if for instance, I set the joystick somewhere that like there where it's A and B predominant, I'm effectively just shoving that entire matrix to the top left, but it's still traveling a journey. It's just doing a different, slightly different thing now. Of course, what this means is that you can write joystick automation into your DAW like I did earlier. And if I did kind of a clockwise journey, drawing a little circle inside my vector joystick, I'm effectively modulating all of these controls dynamically. Speaking of dynamic modulation, you can use far more than just the joystick. If we jump over to the modulator section of the mixer, the mix env mod grid, we get a new matrix here. This allows us to apply modulation sources two per axis to the modulation matrix. So a couple of examples of this in use, let's apply an X axis. So this is the difference modulation between A and C. Let's introduce some aftertouch. This means that ordinarily with no aftertouch in use, the matrix is in control of its own destiny. It's gonna do this. The moment I press into the aftertouch, it's gonna skew all of those values towards the C oscillator. So there's no aftertouch in use there. Now let's emphasize that hell bell sound by pressing into the aftertouch and there it is. That's the hell bell kind of bubbling in the background. Let's control click that one away. This time I'll introduce some positive modulation into my modulation wheel, which means again, this time I'm gonna to skew towards D, which is our synth pad sound and we're controlling the modulation from our wheel. So let's start off at zero. There's the regular sound. And as I hold the key down, the vector matrix is doing its thing. Now, there's me turning the wheel up and you hear that vibra vibrating synth pad dominate. The other sounds don't disappear. These are all modulations stacked on top of each other and their effects are all cumulative. Okay then, that's the vector control side of things taken care of. Now let's have a look at our output routing options. I'll reload my simple template and I'll put it in two oscillator modes. So we've got organ and choir on oscillators A and C. Now they're not inherently routed to any of the output buses on the Korg. We have to specify where they're being routed to. Now this is where we ignored the um, pan page earlier in this tutorial series because the output routing options in the wave station are pretty complicated. The first thing that we need to check is how our performance is configured. So right up at the top level, the performance page, we have this FX bus setting. This is currently overriding everything else. It means all of the sounds of this performance are being routed to all outputs simultaneously. Well, I don't want that. I wanna take manual control. So I'm gonna override this FX bus value with patch instead. So as you can see, there's lots of different routing options here, but if I put it in patch mode, then I've got complete granular control. And now the values in this pan page are gonna determine how this sound is actually routed. So here you can see at the moment, the sound's being routed to all four output buses simultaneously. Now these four output buses are not made equal. In fact, by default, only the first two are active. In order for us to hear buses C and D at all, there are two separate things that we need to do. Firstly, we need to activate those outputs in Cubase or your DAW of choice. If you go up to your wave station, you'll see here's output two. This is basically outputs C and D. Let's activate that. Have a look in your mixer behind as well. When I do, there we go. 
So I've now got two stereo pairs of outputs. The second thing I need to do is activate those outputs from within the synth itself. And here is my output three and four configuration. I'm going to enable it. So now the wave station is genuinely a quadraphonic synthesizer. Now with a sound as simple as this one, with two simple oscillators, you don't really have a need for four outputs. I'll show you an example in a moment of a performance that does use the four outputs better, but let's keep it nice and simple for now. Just for the moment, I'm going to output the organ sound to just bus A and the choir to just bus B. What this means is that I have an organ in my left channel and a choir in the right channel. But that's a very static configuration, hard panning in that way. To introduce dynamic panning, a better way to do that is to head back over to your performance setting. And instead of giving all of the control to the patch, you actually balance the mixing inherently from inside the FX bus. It's a bit strange this. What we wanna do is we want to balance A and B 50-50. So now they're basically two sides of a seesaw. What I'm now gonna do is engage both buses for both sounds. So at the moment, we're back to effectively a mono sound. You can see in the output meters, a very stable sound. What I can then do is modulate the relative pitch amount with any combination of velocity or keyboard. Keyboard is much easier to demonstrate, so I'll stick with that. I'll make the organ more high pitch oriented and the choir more low pitch oriented. So now as I play down the keyboard, you're gonna get a different mix of each of those sounds. There's the choir coming in as the notes get lower. Let's load a new sound at this point, back to Ancient Light on ROM4. This is a really good example of different routings being used for each of your four oscillators. So A is going to A and C, B is going to B and D, C is going to A and C, and D is going to A and D. So these different oscillators are being routed to three different locations, actually A and C share an output pairing, but the others don't. The reason why we do this is answered in the effects engine. Let's have a look at the effects tab. This is a series patch. So here you can see your four oscillators. Oscillators C and D do something very special. They have the capacity to mix their outputs with oscillators A and B. These mix modules, mix three and four, which are currently set to fully wet, which means basically they're on, allows the output from C to be mixed in with A and be output to two different locations. If you don't want that and you wanna keep your outputs isolated, then you disable these mix options. And now oscillators C and D will output to just outputs three and four. And if you do this and you turn your mix values off, then you absolutely need to engage these other outputs or you're simply not going to hear those sounds this is why, by default, these outputs three and four are disengaged because you don't fundamentally need them. You'll tend to find more often than not that these mix values are set to on. And that means you're always going to hear oscillators C and D. They're going to this secondary routing. So it's worth spending a little time having a look at these routing diagrams, the difference between series and parallel. I'm not going to go into the full routing complexity, but you can basically trace through where does your oscillator start? Which effects unit is it going to go through? Is the output from this effect going to get mixed into the output from this effect and ultimately go on to the outside world? So you've got lots of different options to, con to consider here. What this effectively means in a sound like Ancient Light, where you have this complexity of four output routings, is that each of those four different outputs have very dramatically different sounds at any given time. So there's basically just output A. Here's output B, sounding like a sound effect from Flash Gordon. That's output C, which is the left-hand channel of the second output pair. And there's output D. I think that was a hit from the unknown wave sequence that we just heard at the end there. One final point I'll mention with routings Sometimes you want to achieve a state of real clarity where you're only hearing a single oscillator and you can trace through exactly what it's doing. And sometimes that's gonna be difficult to achieve because of the effects that you have in use. If you have a stereo effect, then it's entirely possible for something to come out of oscillator D and get mixed in this effects unit and end up going out through both channels. 
there is a real difference between stereo effects and mono effects. If you want genuine separation of your sounds at all stages, then consider these dual mono effects units. That's literally what they're for. C goes to output three, D goes to output four, and they're not mixed internally at all. And with that said, I think we'll call it a day. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. Please hit like if you did. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Helps me out with the YouTube algorithm. I'll see you next time. Thanks very much.